Hello, my friends. Hello, and welcome once again to the Rustic Von Lodge. Yes, I am back here at the Rustic Von Lodge out in the wilderness. So I came up here uh, to the wilderness, to the Rustic Von Lodge, and our internet is terrible here at the lodge, so I did not get the Sunday Penguin out uh, this week. So the Sunday Penguin is just canceled for this week. I will get the Sunday Penguin I was going to do up next week. So yeah, we missed it. Sorry, guys. But I will not miss an episode or another episode of the Robert E. Howard Show. No, there would be a revolt. So we have the Robert E. Howard Show here again. The Robert E. Howard Show. And this week on the Robert E. Howard Show, we are continuing the adventures of Solomon Cain. I forgot to bring my book of Solomon Cain, The Savage Tales of Solomon Cain, which looks just like this. Uh, but I forgot to bring it. But that is the book you want to read if you want to read the Solomon Cain stories. So the, stories, the story that I'm talking about today is probably the greatest of the Solomon Cain stories. It isn't the last Solomon Cain story. There is another story after this one, uh, and a poem, I believe, came after this one, although I don't have the book with me, so I can't double check. But this story, Wings in the Night, this is kind of where this series was leading Cain, I feel like. Uh, and the Cain series definitely peaks with this story. Uh, because of just how good it is and because of what it's about and how it affects the character of Cain and how Cain is presented in the story. This is a very important Cain story for a lot of different reasons. Uh, first of all, it's just a solid horror story. It was originally published in Weird Tales in the July 1932 issue of Weird Tales. And... It didn't get the cover spot, but it should have, because this story is incredible. So, Wings in the Night, what is this story about? Well, if, if you remember last time, when we talked about the Hills of the Dead, uh, Solomon Cain is in Africa right now. He's adventuring in Africa. He's, he was driven uh, to journey across Africa and right wrongs in Africa, and to have adventures in Africa. So Solomon Cain, the Puritan adventurer, believes that it is, it is his duty and mission to right wrongs and fight evil, which he has had very great success at up to this point. He is understandably confident at this point. And so that is where Solomon Cain, the character, is at. Where Robert E. Howard, the writer, is at is he's nearly done with Cain. Uh, Robert E. Howard said in one of his letters that he would get to a point with his characters where it was like up to this point they're just next to him telling him stories and all of that and then eventually they just left and he would he he would not be able to write convincingly of this character anymore like the like the guy just left and stopped telling him stories and I think this is around the point when that happened right around this story. He had one more story after this one, and then that was it. I kind of think that most of what he had to say with Cain, he said in this story, and maybe a little bit in the next story, but mostly in this story. And then after that, he was done, which is understandable, because the Solomon Cain here is at this point a different Solomon Cain than the Solomon Cain that was introduced to us in the first Solomon Cain stories. The single-minded Puritan adventurer with the mission from God, with a very single-minded way of looking at the world, uh, a very black and white way of looking at the world. At this point, by this story, Solomon Cain has been in Africa for a while. He's only been dealing with Africans. He hasn't seen any Europeans forever. And that has worn away some of these black and white notions that he had about people, about religions, about culture, I think. At least that's how it comes off. That's how Solomon Cain comes off. Like these ideas, their edges are starting to wear away. 
and he's becoming a different person. And along with that, this idea that he is driven by God to do what he does is starting to wear away a little too. Howard always said right up front from the very beginning that that isn't the real reason why Cain does what he does. It's part of the reason, but the real reason is that Solomon Cain has a lust for adventure. He is an adventurer. That's what he is. And that's the real reason he does what he does. He's got a wandering foot. He wants to go out and have adventures. Uh, that's just part of him. And that is what is really driving him on to do what he's doing. But at this point, he's been wandering around in Africa for a while. At this point, he is running away from cannibals because, you know, of course he is. So he's been running away from cannibals and he wanders into this one area where most of these savage cannibals will not follow him. It is an area accursed, perhaps. And as Solomon Cain is wandering in this area, he sees something ahead, and it looks like a figure in the trees. And he wanders over there, and he sees an African native tied to a stake, and he has been horribly mutilated. I don't have the book with me, so I can't read you the section, which I would have read you, just because it's so ghastly and horrible. Maybe it's better that I didn't. But the description of this native is just, and what was left of him, he's been completely skinned and torn apart. His eyes are gone. I mean, he's just a wreck. He's been horribly mutilated. And it's a ghastly description, probably one of the most ghastly descriptions you'll ever find anywhere in a Robert E. Howard story. Really disturbing. And the most disturbing thing to Cain is that this guy's still alive. And Cain is just... He's shocked. Now, Cain is, he says in this section, or the, the narrator says in this section, that Cain has seen it all at this point, right? He's seen the Spanish Inquisition. He's been a slave at a galley. Uh, he has seen how inhuman people can be to other human beings. But this is the worst that Cain has ever seen. And the fact that this guy is still alive is just shocking to him. It just, even a guy as hardened as Solomon Cain is just, this is, this is a lot. So he cuts the guy down, he gently brings him to the ground, says, nobody's going to hurt you anymore, it's going to be okay, which he knows is not true. And the native has just been so horribly mangled and mutilated that he's just delusional. And he mentions the name of his brother, who he, who he says is a priest, Goru. Goru apparently was one of the people that tied him to this stake. And so Solomon Cain is like, you know how Solomon Cain is. When he sees an injustice, and this is about as unjust as anything he's seen, he's going to get justice. So he tells himself, you know what, if I find the guy who's responsible for this, I'm taking care of it. So as he wanders, he is attacked by a winged creature. It's like a man, shaped like a man, but with big bat-like wings, and it attacks them and lifts them in the air, and they have a big battle in the air. Uh, Cain kills him, but he crashes to the earth, and he's terribly injured, Cain is. Cain wakes up in a hut where he, his injuries are being tended to, and he meets not just the chief of this village, but the priest, Goru, the guy that was named by the guy that was tied up outside. Uh, at that stake. Cain tries to, you know, go after him, but he's just too weak from his battle. But Goro seems all right. You know, he doesn't seem like a savage at all. He just seems like a decent person, which is confusing to Cain. Why would a decent person do that to his brother? And so Goro tells him the story of the winged creatures. You see, this area, there were two villages. One of the villages Cain actually came across that I forgot to mention, that was completely destroyed. And this other village is the village that Goru is the priest of. But there were these two villages that were settled by these people, by Goru's people, in this area. And they were driven there by, by their enemies. But in this area, there are a race of winged monsters who just start attacking them. 
And they're so tough, these monsters. This whole, they're like hundreds of these monsters. And they're so tough that even though they're, they try to fight them off, the villagers do, they can't. Uh, these things are just too tough for them. But they can't escape because if they try to escape this area that they're in, the other natives will kill them. So they're trapped. And they have to try to live with these monsters. And one of the ways they've come to appease them a little bit is by tying up a victim. And the monsters will just torment the victim and leave them alone for a little while. So they're in this horrible predicament because they're slowly dying off. They have to sacrifice somebody every once in a while so that, so that not all of them will get killed. But of course, their numbers are dropping because of this. They know it's a no-win situation. And so that when they find Cain, uh, when Goru sees Cain, who actually fought off one of these creatures, sort of successfully, even though he was very injured, he thinks maybe this guy is magic. He recognizes Cain's cat-headed voodoo staff as, as being magical. Nobody in the village has ever seen a European before, so he looks very strange to them. He has these guns and, you know, so he's got what he, what Goro thinks might be magic. He knows Solomon Cain is not a god because, you know, Solomon Cain has been, is pretty tore up. He's obviously a human being just like they are. And uh, Solomon Cain says as much. He says, I'm just, I'm just a guy, just like you guys. But Goro is pinning all his hopes on Cain. He literally fell from the sky. Cain did. And so Goro thinks that maybe Cain can save them from these monsters, this horrible race of monsters that is preying upon them. And so he begs, stay. Stay with us and help us fight these things. Now Solomon Cain is in a predicament here. Because at this point in his career, Solomon Cain has admitted to himself, I'm just a guy, right? How am I, by myself, pretty much, supposed to defeat all of these monsters when these guys couldn't? You know, a whole race or a whole tribe couldn't fight these things off. But this guy's pinning all his hopes on me. How am I supposed to, to battle these things? I'm just a guy. And this is the most human Cain has ever seen never ever seemed in this series. At this point, he's, he recognizes, I might be tough, but I'm just a guy. But at the same time, he still feels like he's got this responsibility. He feels like he's got a responsibility to these people because up to this point in his life, Cain is a writer of wrongs. That's what he does. He takes on this kind of mission. So he feels duty-bound to take it on, even though he thinks there's a very good chance I'm going to fail at this mission. Now, I'm not going to give away the ending of this story, but I am going to give away a pretty big spoiler here. I won't tell you how the story resolves itself. It has a pretty great resolution, this story. But the next thing is so important to the story and to the whole saga of Solomon Cain that I feel like I kind of have to mention it. So Solomon Cain is in this story, in this village, and he feels like he has to stay here. Uh, because of his duty, even though he's afraid that he will fail. And then one night, and so they stop putting out the sacrifices because Cain is here. And these monsters, these winged creatures, just go crazy. They attack the village. Fain, uh, Cain tries to fight them off and fails. He fails miserably. Everybody in this village, except for Cain, who again is fighting off these creatures, better than anybody else because of his weapons and skill. Cain manages to survive, but everybody else is just being killed all around him. Excuse the flies. But, and it's really, the way it's written is just savage. I mean, it is just, it's a brutal bit of this story. This whole story is pretty dark. This is the darkest the Kane series ever gets. 
Everybody in this village is killed. They're massacred. Only Cain is left. And he has to face the fact that he has completely failed. In his mission, he's failed. And this is the first time in this series that he's ever failed like this. It is just devastating. And he is, uh, just as he suspected, and just as he knew, he's just a guy. Up to this point, he thought he was, he was chosen by God to right wrongs, battle monsters. He's always been successful. Now he's left with this. An entire village that counted on him. And he couldn't get the job done. He failed. Everybody's dead. There's nothing left for Cain but to get revenge. Right? That's all that's left for him. Vengeance. Which he does. But I'm not going to tell you what happens in the story. The ending is dynamite. It's a great ending. But the important part of the story and the whole series is right here with Cain's failure, where Cain is shown in full light as being only human. This is the point that Robert E. Howard had taken this series. He has a little bit left to write, but really it ends here. This is the end of Cain's story, really. There's a little bit left to tell. There's one more pretty good story, which I'll talk about. But really, this is the culmination of the Cain saga. Because Cain here is different. His, his viewpoint of his mission is different. His viewpoint of himself is different. The way he views Africans is completely different. In this story, they're just people, just like him. All They are natives, they're villagers, but there's nothing, there's none of those weird stereotypes that you got in the previous stories and the earlier stories. They're not an other. They're just people. People that were counting on him. And that's how they're presented. It's very different. So yeah, Wings in the Night. An incredibly dark story. A great horror story. An excellent Solomon Kane story. Uh, for all those reasons. And so I will, uh, I have one more episode to do on Kane, where I'm going to wrap everything up and talk about the final Kane story and some of the other stories that I didn't talk so much about. Next week, I'm going to be talking about something different for February Fantasy Stories, which is an, uh, an event hosted by the bookish Bryants and some others. I've been reading different fantasy uh, short stories, collections, and this is one of them. This is Swords Against Darkness. Now, in this story, uh, collection, you'll see Robert E. Howard there. The first story in this collection is one of the last stories that Robert E. Howard ever wrote. And he didn't finish it. Uh, it was a story called Necht Semerect, Semerket. Necht Semerket, I think. You know I can't pronounce anything. But the, that's, this story is important because it is either one of the last stories he ever wrote or one of the last stories he ever wrote. It could be the last thing he ever worked on shortly before he took his own life. The reason it's important is because there's a long section of this story where the main character, I can't really call him a hero, even to call the main character of this story an anti-hero would probably be too good for this guy. This guy is shady. But this character at one point is musing on life and death and the meaning of life and whether life is even worth it. There's a long section of, of that where it's basically Robert E. Howard. It sounds a lot like Robert E. Howard is working this stuff out in his own mind and putting these thoughts into the, into the thoughts of his character. It's important because it was so shortly, he was written so shortly before he took his own life. It shows where his head was at. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, a little bit about the story, and a little bit about Robert E. Howard's mindset at the end. So that's going to be next week's episode. The episode following that, I'm going to wrap up Cain. And then we're going to move on to King Call. Okay, guys, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the Robert E. Howard Show. I will catch you next time. Bye, guys.